Well, good morning to all of you. And as you heard, my name is Renat, and um, it's really interesting that it fall. I was born on Sukkot, which is the holiday of uh, the huts in Israel, and I was given the name Renat, which means joy and singing, and it was given on Simchat Torah, which is the happy, joyous day of the year, celebrating this Torah of we, that we have. Uh, before coming here, I was contemplating a lot of how to introduce this controversial topic, knowing versus believing. And uh, I, I'm still kind of a little bit um, excited to talk, so I'm going to read from my paper, so I hope you will excuse me. Uh, today's topic is the difference between knowing and believing. Whenever I'm engaged in a conversation about the topic of life after life, this question always arises. We are all subjected to the question when discussing this topic. Yet there is a huge difference when we say I know versus I believe. I was born and raised in Israel within a secular majority of the people and I've learned to ask questions and not blindly accept or believe everything that was told to me. Usually people who come here to the club hear stories about near-death experiences, from personal experience or from watching others who went through this, like hospice nurses or close family members. They share the same dilemma. Is it annoying or belief? There are many books written by scientists, by psychologists, hypnotherapists who wanted to learn from their clients' previous experiences how to understand their present issues and solve them, or by psychic experiences from people who received messages about previous lifetimes. Also, people question the stories of the Bible, whether they are true or not, and whether to believe in them or not. All of this can be Googled now and give us whatever information we, there is and what we are looking for. During my growing up period, I've read many books about the different levels of consciousness and was intrigued especially by Edgar Cayce, the American psychic, maybe you heard about him. And uh, he's about his ability to see and cure people while he was in trance. It all made me realize that there must be more than just an overdeveloped imagination. Another way to understanding the clear way of that phenomena is to introduce the one brain theory, which teaches us about the two sides of the one brain we have. Western culture focuses on the left side of the brain, which governs the right side of the body, like writing with the right hand, the scientific step-by-step -step detailed thinking, and it has contributed to the modern science and development of new experiences in life using the new technology of scientific research and information that developed the new world of information and innovation, which is terrific. Yet we also need to incorporate the right side of the brain, which governs the left side of the body, the intuitive, seeing the whole picture at once, the creative artistic knowledge, getting the answers fast as a whole, skipping the step-by-step -step information, writing with the left hand, and having more strength on, the, on that side of the body. 
a lot of people are being titled or labeled as uh, dyslectic and uh, short attention um, ability, and they are given a lot of drugs and a lot of uh, look that something is wrong with them. How many of you are left-handed here? Not too many. <laughs> How do you feel about it? Fine, okay. Did uh, your parents or teachers tell you anything about it? Right, yeah. When I was a child, I'm a left teen too, and when I was a child, the teacher in the third grade, that was already after I learned to write, she said to me, you have to write with your right hand. And she pulled out the pen and gave it to me, and I didn't write. Luckily, my mother was open to this, and she said, oh, why didn't you tell me then? And she went and talked to the teacher. So she let me write in my left hand. And a few months later, she needed to write something on the board, and she calls me to write it on the board, and I said, me? And she said, yeah. So I asked her why, and she said, because you have a very clear and nice handwriting, more than anyone how many of you had an intuitive experience, like thinking of someone and then getting a phone call or seeing them? Wow, that's more than people that write. Very good. <laughs> it's, and how did the people react to it in your environment? All right. I was I growing up and I had my, in, I will share you some of the experiences. I was named by my mother and teachers that I have a great imagination and I should write books about that. <laughs> so it's really interesting that when I was in high school, I chose to take the majority of um, a science uh, instead of literature in order to show that I am realistic and not just imaginating. And how many of you had uh, dreams which you can still remember very vividly? Great, great. This is also, it's all signs of the left, the right side of the brain which governs the left side of our body that is more dominant. And uh, nowadays there is more understanding because there were more research done about it. So even at schools then now, treat the children differently than when it was at my time. So all of these are signs that the right side of the brain is strong. But since we do live in a Western culture which emphasizes the rational, realistic side of the brain, we tend to dismiss them or relate to them, ah, oh, that's an imaginative experience. We do it to ourselves just as well. Yet, if we look at all the new discoveries, all the developments, the new ideas, the new theories, new scientific understanding, they all began with the imaginative mind of thinking, always combining the two sides of the brain. So the ones who were bringing new ideas and new knowledge were using the two sides of the brain and still are. <laughs> As uh, you can see in the flyer, you probably read that flower. I've had experience since my early childhood about the subject, which taught me to realize that these experiences were real and not just an imagination, as my parents or teachers used to relate to them whenever we talked about them. I was always close to nature, living in Tel Aviv, a big city now. It was a small one when I grew up. And I li we lived in small houses with large backyards, full with trees, flowers, vegetable gardens. I was always there lying on the ground, feeling, smelling, and watching it all, along with the variety of the insects <laughs> that fascinated me.
The earliest experience that I can remember was when I was about eight years old. It was a rainy winter day, and I was looking through the window of my living room, watching the house across from ours. My mother came to check on me and asked what I was looking at. I said to her, there is an exactly same house in Paris as our neighbor's one. Knowing that I did not travel there, my mother asked if I saw a picture. And I answered no. She was just quiet, adding that I have such a great imagination. Years later, I have traveled with my husband to Paris. And as we walked through the streets, I all of a sudden saw that house. I've shared the story with him, and luckily my husband was open to that phenomena and listened intentively. And we, it was amazing to see the same house that I saw when I was eight years old. When I was in junior high school, a friend of mine in my class told me that they were having a Ouija board session in their home, which her father was active in doing it. He was the head judge in Tel Aviv's Supreme Court. So I was surprised that he would do such thing. And my friend told me that most of the people who come were either engineers or lawyers. That caught my curiosity and I asked if I could come and observe them. After she received permission from her father, we gathered a group of friends and went to her home to watch the experience. When it was over, the people have explained more to us about what was happening, recommended a few books to us to read, and encouraged us to try doing that on our own. We read about Edgar Cayce, the waves above the ether, and we started a group of our own. The information we received was amazing. Living in Israel after the War of Independence, which we were all too young to participate in, we have received messages from and information from Israelis who were killed in that war, giving us the places and number of people who participated in those combat actions. We checked it all at the army archives. And to our amazement, all the details were correct. So it was not our imagination. Time went by. I served in the IDF, got married, became a student in the US, developed my career, had children, etc. So I set these activities aside. Yet years later, we have learned TM, which is Transcendental Meditation. And I was thinking about my mother who passed on from an accident when I was about 13 years old. And at that time, I was about the same age she was when she passed on. And I thought about her a lot and where she was and what she was doing. So one night, she came to me in a dream taking my hand, saying she wanted to show me where she lived. The place was a beautiful suburb near Chicago with small houses, lots of grass and trees, and she showed me her house, telling me she was very happy there and that I should not worry about her. I can still recall the whole dream very vividly. After my husband's passing on 13 years ago, I felt his presence a number of times, helping me on a variety of occasions in ways that there was no place to mistake his specific help. 
Like when I moved to a different house, the boxes became so lightweight for me to carry. Or when I was hanging pictures and other things which were too heavy to balance, and I thought uh, of leaving that to my son-in-law to do that the following day, all of a sudden it straightened and became very easy to do. Our three daughters, <laughs> who are sitting here, <laughs> also have had separate incidents knowing their father came to their help in different situations, as well as our older grandchildren who told us about having similar experiences. I went to different psychic people to communicate through them with my husband. He always came along with other people who were relatives and they all were telling they could not share where they were or what they were doing, that we will know it all when we come there. So I had to be patient. <laughs> My um, husband always said that he was very busy, but if I needed him, he will always come since time and space is very different there. That reminded me, of course, about the quantum physics and the quantum mechanics which have been developed by Albert Einstein. Talking about Albert Einstein, there was another experience when I was in high school. I took the science major and had chemistry as one of my classes. One evening, I sat at home doing my homework, and I came across a formula I could not solve. I was so tired that I put my head on the notebook and fell asleep. All of a sudden, something woke me up, and when I looked up, I saw a circle of light, and inside was the whole formula solved. I opened and closed my eyes a number of times to make sure that it was real. And it kept repeating itself. So I wrote it down. The following day in class, nobody seemed to have the right answer to that formula. The teacher kept asking if anyone else had solved it. I raised my hand with hesitation and the teacher asked me to write it on the board. As I was writing it, she kept asking me with awesome surprise, who helped you? Of course, I said, no one. When I read about Einstein later in my life, and uh, about that he shared with his colleagues saying, most of my formulas I didn't write. His colleagues asked him what he meant by that, and he said, I only come with the beginning of the answer, the rest is being written for me by a higher level of knowing. They asked him whether he became religious all of a sudden, and he said it had nothing to do with religion, just that there was something greater than his own mind. When I read that, immediately I remembered my experience with the chemistry formula, and it all made sense. Today, according to the Hebrew calendar, we start rereading the Bible from its beginning. When, it, when we read about the creation of man in the book of Genesis, it says that God created him from the earth, Adama in Hebrew. Therefore, it was named Adam, and it was wasn't alive till God blew breath into its nostrils, which made him a living human being. Breath and soul in Hebrew are almost the same. Just one, one more letter. Neshima means breath, and neshama means soul. So as long as we breathe, we are having our soul 
and we are still alive. Also, in the last book of the Hebrew Bible, the Deuteronomy, chapter 20, verse 19, there is a verse, the person is like a tree in the field. When we carefully study this message, we realize that just like the trees have a complete cycle of life, so does each person. We never really die. We keep going from one cycle to the next, life after life, reincarnation. We have roots for generations. We grow tall and big. We develop branches and leaves, flowers and fruits. We go through the cycles of blooming and become dry. We then bloom again, serve the environment, have a personal purpose, etc. To end, I'd like to share another experience which I sure which assured me that there is life after life. During the last two weeks before my husband passed on, he repeatedly would sit up in bed, his arms reaching out with a smile on his face. At that time, I thought he was asking for my help. And when I approached him, he signed his he led me to led to um, to move away, nodding with his head like, "No, I don't need help." Later, when I asked him what happened, he said, "They are waiting for me to join them." I begged him to please not go and not leave me, and my husband kept saying, "They are waiting for me with love to join them." So I had to surrender and let him go. All those experiences reaffirmed me that life after life really exists, that the world to come is full of love, and I know this is truth rather than just believing. So this is my experiences, and if you have any questions or anything.